Welcome everyone. I hope you all had an excellent New Year's. And today, guys, we're going to be kicking off 2020 by talking about the most powerful lords for each faction in Total War Warhammer 2. So these are lords that, generally speaking, if you pick them in a battle, you're going to be in good shape. They just have powerful abilities, they're game changers, and they do some serious work. So let us begin with the first faction, which is going to be the Skaven. So this one is probably one that you guys saw coming from a mile away. And yes, it is going to be the filthiest of all rats, or maybe second filthiest. He's up there somewhere. It's going to be Lord Skrulk. So firstly, Lord Skrulk has access to one of the most powerful lores of magic in the entire game. Lore of Plagues is insanely good. It has two very cost-effective summons with Vermintide and a Pestilent Rebirth to summon some Plague Monks. It has a really good AoE buff with Bless with Filth. You guys, of course, have seen this in many battles. It's just a really, really good lore of magic, very consistent, and that alone makes him a really strong pick. But as if that was not enough, yes, he is a caster, but he's also a bit of a solid combatant. He has 54 melee attack with magic damage, which of course can uh, circumvent physical resist that many factions rely on. He also has a discourage ability, if you guys look up here the contaminate so again pretty good at buckling lines definitely no joke there but yeah 54 melee attack 45 melee defense really isn't bad for like a caster type character on top of that 400 weapon strength you know scroll can get in there he can go fisticuffs even if he gets attacked by a big powerful lord someone like wolfric or maybe someone on a dragon yeah he's probably not going to win that fight because obviously he's a caster that's not his role per se but he can fight back he can do some damage and sometimes his attacks can of course break characters that normally wouldn't break with his contaminated effect but what really makes scroll insane like all those variables are good he has a good lore of magic he's got a decent uh essentially a, a set of stats here but on top of that, he has two of the best items in the entire game. So Libra Bubonicus is like Spirit Leech on steroids. It has two charges, 120 second cooldown, but it just does so much damage. So basically, even if Skrulk is getting gooned and just beaten on by things, he is always going to be given back the business. Libra Bubonicus, of course, is a free ability, has two charges, and it is a game changer. It just does so much damage. And that's one of the main reasons why Skrulk is just an auto pick for so many people. On top of that, our filthy rat friend does have the Rod of Corruption, which has been recently nerfed, but nonetheless, three charges is plenty. So not only does he have insane Insane single target DPS with not only his combat stats, but the Libra Bubonicus, but he also has a Rod of Corruption. So he has the ability to do huge AoE damage. Oftentimes the Skaven are going to be huddling together, getting swarmed by tons of units. So he can do AoE crowd clearing with Rod of Corruption and his Pestilent Breath over here from the Lore of Plagues. He can summon things to buffer your formation. He's uh, just got a great stat line. And yeah, Skrulk is no joke. I mean, quote unquote, great by Skaven standards. Of course, his leadership isn't the best and his armor sucks, but you know, he's got okay combat stats for a caster character. So for the Skaven, the best Lord in my opinion is Lord Skrulk. Uh, there are some other honorable mentions, of course. I think that the uh, some of the other, I think Deathmaster is pretty good, but I don't think he's anywhere near the power level of Skrulk. I think having a Gray Seer on the Bells is really, really strong. The Unholy Clamor is certainly a game changer as well. But for me, in my anecdotal experience, Skrulk is going to be the number one pick. So now guys, we're going to be jumping on over to the Beastmen. So we'll see you in just a second. And now, my friends, we're back here with the Beastmen. So for the Beastmen, Morker, the Shadow Gave, is easily going to be taking the crown. And really, for the Beastmen, you don't have too many options. You have Morker, you have Kazrak, you have a Beast Lord, you have Malagor the Dark Omen certainly isn't bad, and I think he could be a contender as well, because his particular lore magic isn't bad nowadays. Of course, summoning Sigors, and of course, the Vigor bonus it gives is quite nice, but Morker is just a game changer, and he's always picked because he's so consistent, he's so durable, and you're pretty much always going to get some value out of this bad boy. So firstly, he's got pretty good stats, 55, 45, 400. He's not like a raw combat lord, but his durability makes his damage output pretty good, right? Because oftentimes there are other lords that hit a lot harder, but they don't last as long as this filthy, disgusting cow. 55, 45, 400. But what makes him really, really good is the fact that, number one, he has regeneration. So this bad boy is going to be healing himself. So as if, you know, he wasn't already hard enough to kill as a foot lord, getting knocked over, constantly healing. He's immune to psychology. But more importantly, guys, he has an insane amount of support. He can bring in one group through the Spirit Essence of Chaos, of Chaos Spawn. So basically, this ability just kills a nearby unit that's below 20%, just nukes him outright. So for example, you bring Fate Abuna, you see some Iron Breakers. Uh, they get brought below 20 really quick, and boom, they just explode. It is so good. And there was a time when Worker was just obscenely busted. Back when he first came out, he had two charges of each of these, the Spirit Essence of Chaos plus his Staff of Ruinous Corruption. So on top of that, Staff of Ruinous Corruption can summon another group of spawn at whim. So the other one you don't really have control over, but this one you do. You can summon spawn and basically spawn are like nowadays a pretty good unit, especially Beastmen spawn, which do a poison. You're getting like 2,000 gold worth of value by just bringing Morker. Yes, it's temporary. Yes, there's some in units and they eventually will disappear. But the fact still stands is that Morker is just a, a value train. You're getting 2,000 gold worth of basically free units that are actually pretty good now. And on top of that, he's extremely hard to kill. He's durable. And uh, it's just a real thorn in the side of uh, most enemies. So there you have it, guys. For the Beast Bend, it is going to be Morker the Shadow Gave, an absolute uh, monster of a character with his disgusting uh, claw. I wonder what like chaos deity he like aligns himself with. I, I guess the beastmen kind of have their own thing going on. But yes, it is going to be more of the shadow gave. Now, guys, we're going to be jumping over to the Bretonians. We'll see you in just a second. 
And now we arrive in the fair lands of Bretonia, and yes, guys, hail to the king, baby, he is back. King Lewin is most certainly, in my opinion, the most powerful lord for Bretonia. So firstly, he has some really good mount options. And up on Beaky here, or however you pronounce that particular mount's name, he is an absolute powerhouse. 100 speed, so he's super quick. He can outrun dragons, 56 melee attack, 45 melee defense, which is pretty good considering he's a mounted lord. A lot of times these big mounted monsters don't really have the best melee defense, but 45 makes him a very viable duelist. Great charge bonus, great weapon strength, great AP values. But what really makes Lewin really solid and sets him apart from characters that are kind of in a similar class is that he has regeneration. So, of course, with the beloved son of Bretonia, I believe is what it's called, or excuse me, the ladies' champion, this bad boy is able to heal himself. And self-healing, you guys will probably notice it as a bit of a recurring trend here on this list. Generally, characters that can heal themselves and are very strong and independent are going to be here on this list. So he has the ladies' champion. He does also have the beloved son of Bretonia. So uh, this can give melee attack, charge bonus, weapon damage, and immune to psychology. It, it's, it's really, really good. But really, what makes him an ace is the regeneration and his really damn good item called the Sword of Caron. So his mighty sword that he wields is just an absolute game changer. If you have a, a big blob of Bretonian knights going to engage against the Empire or the foul warriors of chaos, you bring in Lewin, you pop this, and suddenly your knights are just going to massively outvalue and outclass your opponent's calf. It lowers their armor by 30, making things like Knights of the Realm and Battle Pilgrims more viable in combat. It also lowers melee defense. So you can use this in a big kind of game deciding blob fight. You can use this in a situation where you're just trying to support your infantry line or if he's just simply dueling someone. Being able to lower someone like Malekith's melee defense down to like 10 or 20, whatever it may be, after the nerf or after the nerf that the Sword of Crone provides, it's just really good. So ultimately, very, very powerful item, powerful duelist, highly mobile, self-healing. And on top of that, he has a nice little perk with the Lion's Shield. So, you know, sniping is a very big part of this game. Uh, even the AI at times will try and snipe your Lord and multiplayer as well, of course, uh, having the ability to see something coming. It's a big gaze of Nagash, or you see a Spirit Leech being cast on him or some other effect of Fireball, whatever, you name it. He's able to get massive missile resist. So let's say you're playing a Wood Elf player, Prey of Anothrama goes down, you pop this when you're being sniped by Waywatchers, He'll survive. Other lords won't. So that's why Lion Shield is so good and also gives you magic resist. So if you're fighting a unit that does magical uh, magical damage, like a big monstrous unit that does magical damage, hey, why not take another 44% ward save? On top of that, he causes fear and terror. He has the blessing of the lady, so he's going to be getting 20% uh, 20 physical resist on top of that, which is insanely good. Lady Champion heals him. And of course, we saw the beloved son of Bretonia, which is a conditional buff, but when it does go off, it's really, really good. So for Bretonia, it is going to be the king. Hail to the king, baby. He's back. And now we're going to be jumping on over to the Dark Elves. And now, my friends, we arrive in the realm of the Dark Elves. And the number one pick here is going to be Malekith, the Witch King. So hail to the king once again, baby. It would seem that the kings are doing pretty well here on this list. But this one was actually pretty close. I think that Marathi is also very good. And situationally, in certain matchups, she might be better. Certain circumstances in campaign. But for the most part, I feel like Malekith is a more consistent pick. You see him picked so much in tournament play and ladder play and pretty much every circumstance. And for a reason. So if you look at his stats, it's pretty good. 54, 52, 520, huge AP value. So just like most dragons, he can get in there. He can go fisticuffs. He can burn down single entities, heavy cav. Pretty much wherever you aim this nuclear dark health missile, he's going to be doing some serious work. But what makes Malekith a really, really just a powerhouse of a character is the fact that he's a really, really good melee combatant. On top of that, he does also have access to the lore of darkness and one of the best spells in the game in the form of Soul Stealer. So for 18 Winds of Magic, he can cast this spell. And this is one of those spells that can single-handedly turn around a bad situation. Let's say you dive in Malekith into a group of like very, you know, heavy-duty anti-large troops. You pop this, it does AoE damage, it heals them. You pop it on enemy lords, it's going to do damage. It's good in dueling, it's good for crowd control. Soul Stealer is just such a such a good spell. On top of that, Lore of Darkness has a couple other good spells, but for the most part, it's basically Lore of Soul Stealer, as this is pretty much the single spell you often see brought in conjunction with Mark of, or Word of Pain, which can, of course, lower melee attack of a, a unit of your choosing. So basically, Malekith is an insanely powerful melee combatant. He's up on a very, very powerful mount. Could deal with single entities, pretty much deal with any threats you're looking for. And of course, as it is a dragon that he's often riding in, even on foot or on his chariot, he's quite good as well. And there are some matchups in which you don't want to bring a big target up on the sky. But for the sake of this video here, we're going to be looking at him on the dragon. He does, of course, have the Noxious Breath, so a very powerful breath attack. And he has a really good bound ability called Gaze of Malice. So Gaze of Malice in conjunction with Soul Stealer is really good at clearing stuff out. Gaze of Malice, of course, is a breath attack. He has three charges. It's free. It's free real estate. Can't complain. What does the tooltip say? If looks could kill, oh wait, it turns out they can. Oh yes, the Gaze of Malice coming in from Malekith. So on top of that, he does have access to a couple decent items. I brought them all, but they're not all great. So the Supreme Spell Shield is something you don't see terribly often. It basically affects your opponent's wins of magic, but you have to be very close for it to work. But he does have the Circlet of Iron, which adds to your opponent's miscast chance, which can be good in matchups in which you're expecting your opponent to just be spamming abilities nonstop. 
but he also has this really good item called the Destroyer, super heavy metal. So when he gets in close quarters combat within 40 meter range of someone, he can basically add uh, 15 seconds to their cooldown. So against green skins, this can delay their wand. Against casters, this can make it so they can't heal themselves. For example, if he's fighting another big caster, let's say like Jerthu, Jerthu won't be able to cast spells terribly often because the Destroyer will be proccing. So again, Malekith, a powerful melee combatant, just a huge game changer, he has access to Soul Stealer, a really good bound ability in Gaze of Malice, and of course the Breath Attack, which comes with most dragons. And he also has Destroyer and a couple of other situational items. So Malekith, the Witch King, is going to be the number one supreme pick here for the Dark Elves. And guys, we'll see you in the next selection. And now, my friends, we're going to be taking a look at the Proud Dawi. So for the Dwarves, I think that the most powerful pick is the Rune Lord, the humble Rune Lord. And yes, he's not as much of a world beater as most of the other Dwarf Lords like Ungram or Grombrindle, the White Dwarf. And of course, he serves a very different purpose. So one of the main issues for the Dwarves is their mobility. The fact that oftentimes, if you want to get huge value out of Grombrindle or Ungram, you're going to have to catch something. So Ungram's going to have to pump those Dwarven legs. He's going to have to catch a dragon or some trolls all of which are very, very fast. So yes, they can get their value if they can get onto the good targets. They can be huge, huge powerhouse characters. But what's really nice about the Rune Lord is, is he doesn't really suffer from those problems. So firstly, he's on a very stalwart, durable body. 120 armor, decent HP pool, and decent defensive stats with a 40 melee defense. So not as much melee defense, again, as the com combat characters, but the 120 armor and good leadership usually gets him through most trouble, but he has really good runes. So if you look here at the Master Rune of Negation, this bad boy can give a big group of Dwarven infantry or units or just Dwarves in general, 44% ward save against all damage types. So even if like you can't catch the enemy uh, character that's causing problems, you can make the units that are having to fight him very, very durable. And this is a really, really good ability, but really why he's so good is because of the Master Rune of Wrath and Ruin. So one of the biggest issues dwarves have had for the longest time is the fact that they have trouble catching things. They are a slower faction, a little bit more stationary. Uh, they're natural sprinters <laughs> over short distances, I suppose, but they do have trouble, again, catching faster units like Cav. So anything that can slow units, whether it be back in the day, the Tormentor Sword for the dwarves, but in this case, having the Master Rune of Wrath and Ruin is just a game changer. So for three charges, you can use it for the most part over the course of the battle in very clutch moments to allow your slayers to catch things, to allow your guns to saturate on a dragon or on chariots. It's just so good. Negative 22 or 72% speed is no joke. On top of that, he does have the Master Rune of Oath and Seal. It's not bad. Um, oftentimes you see people just bring these two runes, but if you, if you have the extra gold, just bring it. It's not bad. It's going to be putting your Longbeards and other troops up to like 140, 160 armor, depending on what type of unit you're hitting. And it's quite good. He has a couple other abilities. He has the Master Rune of Grungni, which can be good as well. If you're expecting some missile trades, perhaps some treacherous wood elves, the foul scum of the forest there, you can uh, get that juicy, juicy missile resist here, which affects himself as well as nearby troops, which is very, very helpful depending on the matchup. He also has the Forge Fire, so he can give armor piercing damage. And yeah, you see what I'm saying? He brings so much to the battlefield that like, even if he's necessarily not destroying things, he's going to make the other dwarves more durable or uh, make them do more damage. And lastly, he does have the Rune of Hearth and Home, which is very nice. It gives immune to psych to nearby troops. And some of the more elite Dwarven troops do, are, of course, have immune to psychology. But giving this to, you know, baseline Dwarf infantry who are having to fight, you know, very elite terror-causing monsters can make it even tougher to break Dwarven lines. So in my opinion, the Rune Lord is going to be the strongest pick here for the Dwarf Lords. Arise, sons and daughters of Sigmar, and welcome your one true emperor, Karl Franz. So Karl Franz is going to be my pick for the best Empire Lord in Total War Warhammer 2. And Karl Franz is good for a multitude of reasons. So if you take a look here, this bad boy does have 100 armor. So if he's flying above the battlefield, looking like the glorious man he is, taking fire from goblin archers, he's going to be pretty tough against that fire. Granted, Franz, much like most of the Empire, is a bit of a glass cannon. He has 38 melee defense and no way of self-healing himself, unlike Boris Toddbringer. But I think his offensive output and his force multiplying effects make him a little bit of a better pick than Toddy, not in every matchup, but generally speaking. So he has 90 speed, 56 melee attack, 38 melee defense, 490 weapon strength with some juicy, juicy AP values of 345, but his charge bonus is really, really good as well at 90. But what makes Franz really, really good is his great offensive output and sniping potential. So Franz is kind of like a heat-seeking missile. You send him after a caster or an enemy lord that's kind of vulnerable and on the ground or something, and he's going to be able to get Gaul Morales and just smash their face in. His items are really good as well, Reichland Runefang. And this is what I was talking about when I was uh, mentioning the force multiplying effect of Franz. So with Raikon Runefang, he's usually riding with like Demogriff Knights or flying above them. And the Demogriff Knights take a hard fight against some Chaos Knights or some Dragon Ogres. And Franz comes in just like in the cinematic, pops the Raikon Runefang and suddenly your guys will fight longer due to having better leadership. He gets these buffs as well, but it also gives 24 melee attack. So that, you know, can put your Demogriff Knights up to like, you know, 50, 60, 70 melee attack, depending on the variant. It's really, really good. He also has Foe Seeker and Stand Your Ground, pretty much standard stuff there. But Franz, like I said, a really good duelist, a really good glass cannon, or a cannon, I should say. He's not like a completely glass cannon, but he gets in there and, you know, can take some damage. But Galmaras is really good as well. 
It gives him a bonus for Slarge of 16 and also 50% armor piercing damage. So Franz is going up against another enemy powerhouse and oftentimes he will, right? Franz is going to be fighting characters like Malekith. He's going to be fighting uh, enemy monsters like the Sphinx of Usef or Setra the Imperishable. This is the tool he needs. The Mighty Warhammer is going to be giving him the tools he needs to take down those big targets. So again, I think that Franz is the best pick for the Empire. There are some other good picks, of course. Uh, Boris Toddbringer is really good if you want to explore other lores of magic aside from lore of life. Franz typically does kind of force you to take lore of life because, you know, Empire, like I said, not the tankiest roster. Yes, Denver Gift Knights have 125 armor. Franz has 100 armor, but for the most part, they're very much a finesse faction. If you get caught out of position or slip up and you don't have lore of life, you can really pay the troll toll. Now, Boris, if you want to use like lore of fire or lore of death, is a really good choice because he heals himself, but generally across the board, I would say that Franz is a bit of a stronger pick. So there you have it, guys, Carl Franz, and now we're gonna be jumping over to the next faction. And now, my friends, we arrive at the Glorious Wa. So for the number one pick for the Greenskins, it is gonna be Wurzog, and it was pretty close. I think that Azag is a very powerful character, but the amount of support that Wurzog brings to the battlefield just sets him apart. It's very, very strong. Not only does he have sick dance moves, but he does also have a snare, a force multiplying effect of the Bonewood Staff, and a very good lore of magic. So if we look at him, he has the Wah, of course, we has get back here, but this is what's really good. FG of the Git. So two charges over the course of the battle, he can snare anything in place. So it can be flying, it can be on the ground. It doesn't have a conditional snare like some of the other ones in the game. And it also does a little bit of damage. So if you're facing off against a spooky ghost unit, this is a way to take out something like a Banshee from the Vampire Counts. It won't like kill them, but it does pretty good damage. On top of that, he does have access to the Big Wah, which is a very good lore of magic, especially with his item, which is, I think, probably one of the best items in the entire game, the Bonewood Staff. So whenever Wurzog casts a spell, anything, it could be your cheap spell that costs four wins of magic. It could be a giant erect foot of Gork. It's going to give your entire army of savage orcs, black orcs, goblins, plus 12 melee attack. And melee attack is one of those stats that, you know, obviously is very important. And just adding a little bit of a melee attack or a little bit of a melee attack to a unit is something that can make it exponentially better. I mean, you guys have seen over the course of the game when they buff something like three or four melee attack on like an infantry unit, people are like, oh, they might be good now. So just imagine your entire army getting a charge bonus melee attack, and then stacking that with that juicy, juicy green skin wall. So that alone is like makes Warzog super good. So again, he has the Bonewood Staff. He does also have Squiggly Beasts, which is okay. Uh, oftentimes I see players, uh, players skip this, but it's not a bad item. It does help with his power reserves and his recharge rate, which is you know, pretty good. But, but really, the Bonewood Staff is what shines. The fact that he has access to a really good lore of magic with great spells, great support. And last but not least, he does also have a snare through FG of the Git. So he has, it's just so many good tools. Now, one thing about Wurzog, you have to be careful. He's very squishy, 25 melee defense, 30 armor, but he's got some moves. You can see he can uh, he can dance around, dodge some arrows. And of course he does have a mount through Spleen Ripper, but I figured for the sake of this video, we would have him on foot because I wanted to see him dance. So there you have it, the number one pick for the Greenskins. And now we're going to be jumping onto the next faction. And now for the number one pick here for the High Elves, it's going to be Alariel the Radiant. So she's by far the best pick in my opinion. And yes, Tyrion is quite good, but he suffers from many of the issues that those low mass duelist characters do. He has his horse, but he's going to have trouble pushing through infantry, getting on those targets that he really needs to be on. And oftentimes he's just kind of chasing things or getting stuck in troublesome positions. Uh, Teclis is good. Uh, Teclis can be very, very good in a multitude of situations, especially if you're going for a missile build. So for example, if you really want to get nets of Aminatok in conjunction with some healing, you know, he brings a lot to the battlefield. But at the end of the day, the Pigeon Queen, Alariel, is going to be taking the cake simply because of how insane of a healer she is. So if we look here, she does have Arcane Conduit, which is really nice. It's going to allow you to get more Earth Bloods and more spell diversity. She has the Stave of Averlorn or Stave of Averlorn. Whatever. Sorry, my brain's a little bit slow right now, but nonetheless, it's an okay item. You don't see it terribly often. Oftentimes people don't bring it, but it certainly doesn't hurt to have. If you have a little bit of extra dough or if you're in campaign. And lastly, she does have, this is what makes her the best, the Star of Avalorn. So this is pretty much a must bring. It's a, it's a heal. It's free. It has two charges, 120 second cooldown, and it's just insanely good, especially since the High Elves have a couple of really good monsters in the form of Star Dragons and, and Phoenixes, and of course things like Dragon Princes, which are very expensive, and you really want to keep them alive to get that money's, uh, your money's worth. The Star of Avalorn is your answer. You use this to heal those guys up, and it's just a game changer. I've seen so many games where I'm like, oh, the High Elves have lost, it's over, and then suddenly Alariel stacks on top of a Star Dragon, some Princes, and then this goes off, and it's like, oh, oh wait, the High Elves are winning that engagement, and it's simply because of how good the Star of Avalorn is. So she's pretty fast on her mount. 110 speed here on her bird it makes it very, very tough for enemy uh, aerial units to catch her. So you don't really have to worry too much about dragons or or stuff like that. She can keep away from them and she's going to be able to support the battlefield and heal. Yeah, she's not like terrible in melee, actually. She's got 45, uh, 47, and 390. Plus she also has a really cool ability called the Boon of Aisha. So this, I've actually seen this win games. It gives magic damage to all nearby allies. So for example, if you're trying to deal with ethereal units or clan Eshin, plague monk type units that have physical resist, this is actually going to give your army a pretty good uh, kind of boost of damage, a boon, I would say. 
get. She's really, really good. On top of that, she has a mixed lore of magic. So she has Arcane and Forging, which is a hard counter against green skins. She has Tempest, which is really good for missile builds or just winning those aerial duels with your Star Dragon. Shield of Thorns is great. Earthblood's great. Banishment, you know, situationally not bad. These are probably two of the weaker spells here in her kit, but she has great spells. She has great items, great battlefield utility. Alariel is no joke. So that is going to be the pick here for the Hile. So we'll see you guys in the next faction. And now, my friends, we head on over to Lustria to meet our cold-blooded friends, the Lizardmen. So for the Lizards, it's not going to be a single Lord, but rather it's going to be the Slon. And for the sake of this video, we shall use this glorious Heaven Slon to represent his people proudly and thickly atop his mighty palanquin here. But nonetheless, Slon are just such good characters. Firstly, they have crazy good HP. 5,600 HP is going to make them rather tough to snipe. And I can't tell you how many games I've seen one of these Toads floating. I'm like, oh, it's a free kill. Let's go get that Slon with like Carl Franz. But it still takes forever to kill them. 5,600 HP is like in Throg territory. Not quite as much as like Kolek or those monstrous, monstrous characters, but their thickness uh, certainly packs a lot of uh, a lot of HP. Now, aside from that, they are relatively squishy and somewhat vulnerable to missile play because they do have 45 armor and pretty pitiful stats in general. But Slons just bring so much utility to the battlefield. So Mazda Mundi has two bound spells. He has Ruination of City and Banishment. But most Slons do just have Banishment, which is great. It's a very expensive spell. Oftentimes, I, well, I think it costs 16 Winds of Magic. It's in that ballpark. So getting this for free, two charges, it's a game changer. If you cast this on Chosen or like some handgunners in the back, like any number of targets, it's just going to be doing a lot of damage. Now, there is some RNG to this. It can go the wrong way, but in general, it's a free spell. You can't really complain, and it's just really nice that it comes in this uh, this tightly packed Slon package. Now, on top of that, Slon have really good items. The Aura of Pretzel, or of, or of uh, Quetzal, as it's actually called, gives armor and melee defense to all nearby troops. So if a Slon's being beaten on, they can cast this to protect themselves, putting their armor up to 75 and their melee defense up to, I believe, 46. But in general, uh, not 46, uh, 56, excuse me, but it's uh, yeah, it's really good. You can use it to buff your cold ones, your swords, your temple guard that are defending the slon. It's just a great activatable item. On top of that, they have the blood statue of spite. It doesn't do insane damage, but it has four charges. It gives the slon some uh, consistent damage output. It's really good against like elite infantry and things like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not bad at all. On top of that, they have cold blood, like all the lizard characters, not much to talk about there. And they lastly have Shield of the Old Ones. And this is one of the main reasons why Slon are so good. Uh, Shield of the Old Ones is on a minute and a half cooldown. It does 22% ward save against all damage types, magic, physical, you name it. And it also gives leadership. So if you're really trying to hold a position or win a big uh, kind of a you know game deciding fight, this is a spell for you. So again, Slon just have some great items through the Blood Statue of Spite or a Pretzel here, Banishment, and the Shield of the Old Ones. And they have access to a multitude of good lores of magic, fire, heavens, uh, you know, life, you name it. And of course, if you want to bring Mazda money, you get access to Nets of Amatok and healing all in one package. Slon are just really, really good characters. They can nuke the front lines with a Blood Statue and Banishment, regardless of your lore of magic. And if you want to go full nuke, you can use like Wind Blast, a Blood Statue, Banishment. There's a lot you can do. And on top of that, they have really good kind of AOE buffing abilities in the form of Shield of the Old Ones and the Aura of Quetzal. So the Slon are going to be the champions of the uh, Lizardmen people, which makes sense. We'll see you in the next one. And now we head to the frozen north to meet our good friend Wolfric, who is going to be the pick here on this list for the best Norskin lord. So, I mean, Norska in general doesn't have too many options for lords. You have Wolfric, you have Throg, and you have Ramrod or Chieftain. So they unfortunately have been neglected for a while in that respect. But I have a feeling that once we get game three, or perhaps some free LC will come along eventually to add like Valkyrie the Bloody and some of the other cool characters from lore. But that's a talk for another time. For the sake of this video, we're going to be talking about why Wolfric is the best choice for Norska. So firstly, he has a really good ability that is probably just the main sole reason. It's called Hunter of Champions. It's on a 90 second cooldown. It actually has really good range at 100. So it's not something you have to be super close for. That means like you can use it as a utility ability. Even if Wolfric isn't nearby, you have some skin wolves going to fight a big, uh, you know, enemy lord or hero. You can pop this on them and they'll do a lot of work. So it slows by 50% or 48%. Lowers armor by 30 and melee defense by 40. So basically it just makes them super squishy. Most characters in general don't have like 40 or 50 melee defense. So they're going to be almost, you know, zero or, or close to zero, depending on the character. Lowering their armor is quite good for Norska. And uh, yeah, it's just a really strong ability. Of course, slows and snares are just game changers as well. He does also have fight or die and Sea Fang is quite good as well. Uh, Norska, obviously, uh, one of the main ways they do get into people's back lines and tear apart their bow lines and their gun lines is using Sea Fang in tandem with Lore of Shadows and Pendulum and Burning Skull effects. So uh, Sea Fang is a really good ability, has three charges. And also on top of that, I've seen some MLG plays before where people use Frostbite or Sea Fang not to do damage, but rather to Frostbite. 
and slow a retreating character to allow Wolfric to catch them. Now, the stats you're seeing right now are the stats of Wolfric on a Mammoth, but if you look at Wolfric on foot, he has insanely good combat stats. Granted, he does have the best AP values, so that's his main issue on foot, but oftentimes he's brought to the Mammoth. So you can see here on the Mammoth, he's got 10.5k HP, a good charge bonus, and typically his bonus for infantry will allow him to delete anything on the ground. If you want to bring him on horseback or his chariot, he's going to have more similar to his traditional stat line, which is around 70 melee attack and 50 melee defense. And also on foot, he does have more armor at 100 or 120. I'm not, it's pretty damn high. I think it's probably 100. But yeah, Wolfric is a great character. Uh, Hunter of Champions really allows him to catch and kill things. And even on his mammoth, he's a pretty good duelist. If you're dueling like a dragon or anything or a dragon character, you drop Hunter of Champions on them. And they're going to be a, a pretty juicy target because regardless of their melee defense, it's going to be low enough that his 38 melee attack will get through. And his 525 weapon strength is going to you know hit true as well. So... So definitely, uh, Wolfric's going to be our man. Throg is quite good as well again, in cer certain matchups, but across the board, you're almost always going to see Wolfric. He's just a very good character, has good abilities, and uh, this man does not mess about. He, uh, he gets his prey. So we'll see you guys in the next faction. And now, my friends, we head to the Realm of the Tomb Kings to take a look at everybody's favorite, lovable, charming, handsome necromancer, Arkin the Black. So this was a very close one. I think that Cetra is very good as well, and many people would probably argue that Cetra is indeed better, but in my anecdotal experience, in my playstyle, I find that Ark in the Black is my favorite choice, and I think he is pretty damn good. So let's go ahead and take a look at why. So firstly, he has some really good items. Staff of Nagash is insanely powerful. It subtracts 30 seconds from your cooldowns. It improves your power recharge rate. So this is going to be refreshing your Tomb Blade, lowering your spells, just so much good stuff. Now, the next item is the Tomb Blade of Arkin. This bad boy has five charges, so over the course of the battle, you can summon five massive blobs of skeletons. I believe they have 150 models compared to the standard 120, so you're going to get just a huge horde of skeletons. They just do a ton of work for tar pitting, blocking charges, protecting Arkin from being attacked, and just really good. Summons in general are very powerful, so being able to have that to uh, disrupt your opponents is just incredibly good. So the Tomb Blade of Arkin, another strength of his, especially how well it synergizes with the Staff of Nagash for bringing its cooldown to a much more manageable kind of a time frame there. And here's his other really good ability. This is a Libra Mortis. So much like Shield of the Old Ones, this bad boy is going to be giving 44% physical resist to a blob of your troops. And Tomb Kings often do fight in pretty close quarters or close together using their constructs and their defensive uh, walls of skeletons. So being able to pretty much almost nullify half of the incoming damage from standard troops and uh, physical damage types is really damn good. And it's on a 90 second cooldown. You have three charges. So, so far, right out of the gates, we have three just game changing abilities here from Ark in the Black. Now, on top of that, he has access to one of the best lores of magic in the game, if not the best. Well, I think Lore of Vampires is probably a little better, but uh, he has Sphere of Leech, he has Fate of Buna, he has some nice leadership effects if you're facing off against factions like the Beastmen or the Greenskins. And yeah, you can't really talk, you, you could talk forever about how good Lore of Death is, but yeah, he has Lore of Death, he has really good items. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's not terribly expensive. If you bring Arkin on, on foot or on horse or even on his chariot, he's much cheaper than the other Lord options for the most part. And of course, that depends on what you bring, but Arkin the Black is a very, very solid character. So there he is, my number one pick here for the Tomb Kings. And now we're going to be jumping on over to the next faction. So we'll see you in a second. All hail the mighty, my friends, as we arrive at the Vampire Coast. And literally, we are on a coast right now. You can look back here on the map, so I figured that would be quite fitting. But for the number one lord here for the Vampire Coast, it is going to be Luther Harkin. Now, for a long time, I think it was Count Noctilus. In the early days, Count Noctilus was extremely oppressive, quite overpowered, but he's received a slew of nerfs. His summons have been nerfed. Uh, just in general, across the board, he's had reductions. So I think that Luther Harkin probably at this point is the best lord, and he's just a really good duelist. He's highly mobile. He has great sniping potential and some really good abilities. So let's go ahead and take a look. So firstly, he's on a Terror Geist, which is nice. He has 460 weapon strength, 44 melee attack with poison as well. And from a duelist perspective, being able to bring down the stats of a, a high, just 400, 500 weapon strength unit uh, proportionally with the percentage here is really, really good. So he's uh, just a scary duelist. There's few characters in the game that can really go fisticuffs with Luther. He's got 44, 42, 460. But even if you don't want to dive down and fight someone, let's say they're like, you know, being guarded by a bunch of halberds. Luther can simply fly above them and shoot them with his massive blunderbuss. And it also has a disrupted on it. So if you're shooting a caster, it adds a miscast chance and lowers their physical resist. So what a nice little perk right there. But this blunderbuss or his pistol, whatever it is, it has a, it has crazy AP values as well. So you can just sit above, he can snipe characters. And then when they're softened up, he can go down for the kill. So Luther Harkin, definitely a, a terror in the night. On top of that, he does a Horn Swoggle, an extremely good debuff here. Uh, lowers melee defense, lowers speed, lowers armor, so he can use this to catch someone. He can use this if somebody's chasing him and he's beat up and he needs to kite them. Just so much utility out of this spell. He also has Power Siphon. It's okay. Uh, this is something that I would probably just bring against Greenskins because you cast this on their Lord and basically they're not going to be able to cast the Wah for a substantial portion of the game because it adds 15 seconds to their Wah ability, which can only be recharged in melee combat. 
Next, he does, of course, have a Death Shriek, which is uh, the bound ability here of his Terror Goose. And this is good. I mean, yeah, it just really adds to his sniping. He can be shooting with a pistol. He can do a Death Shriek uh, Breath on them, and it does some great work. So Luther Harkin, in my opinion, is the most powerful lord for the Vampire Coast. An outstanding duelist, a great, you know, monster hunter. Uh, and he's on the goose as well. And what's cool about the Death Shriek gooses is compared to regular terror geists, they don't rely on a bonus for a large. They just generally speaking have better stats, which make them good, you know, a little bit better versus infantry compared to the Vampire Councilman, which is more of a specialist against large units. So there you have it. Luther Harkin, the man, the myth, the legend. And you can see here he has most of the typical vampire goodness. He has regeneration. And of course, he causes terror on this mighty steed, which is where you'll typically see him. And next, my friends, we're going to be heading on over to the Vampire Counts to take a look at the cousins here of the Vampire Coast. See you soon. And now we arrive at the spooky, scary doorstep of our friends, the Vampire Counts. And for the Counts, I think that the most powerful lord is Manfred von Karstein. Now, this was very close. The Blood Dragon Vampire Lord with his duelist capabilities and the Helm of Discord is very, very close to eking out the number one spot for me. But here it is going to be Manfred. And let's go ahead and explain why. So firstly, take a look down here. This is one of the reasons. You can see Manfred has access to a ton of utility and two of the best lords of magic in the game. So Manfred, if you see here on the bottom right, you can actually toggle between, excuse me, Lore of Death and Lore of Vampires. And like I said, in my opinion, those are probably two of the best lores in the entire game. So you can basically pick and choose spells depending on the matchup you're in. So for example, if you're facing off against the Greenskins, why not bring Curse of Years to make it so they can't cast the wall? You can bring Invocation, you can bring Raise Dead. If you're feeling a little bit spicy, you can bring Winds of Death. And if that's not enough, you go over to Lore of Death and you're able to bring Spirit Leech and Buna, like just game-changing spells. But you might ask at this point, how am I going to afford all this? How am I going to cast all these spells? It's too much. I can't do it all. I'm too weak, Anakin. Help me. Well, the answer is, is you actually just have uh, Master of the Black Arts and the Sword of Unholy Power. So Manfred has his own Arcane Conduit, which is very good. It increases his power reserves, uh, reserves and power recharge rate. But more importantly... He has an item which is called the Sword of Unholy Power, and it's kind of hidden, tucked away in here. So when Manfred's in melee combat, he's going to be getting basically even more Winds of Magic. So basically, if you're playing your cards right, over almost the entire game, you're going to be benefiting from this perk of improving your power recharge and your reserves. On top of that, you have the Master of the Black Arts to stack with it. So he just has so much Winds of Magic, probably the most in the entire game of all the characters. You're able to just get cast so many spells, so many more than other characters. And with him, it really means a lot because he has access to some of the best lords of magic in the entire game. On top of that, he has really good combat stats for a caster lord. 90 armor, 70, 50, 480, and he has access to a multitude of good mounts. He can be on horseback, he can be on a hellsteed, and he can also be on a mighty zombie dragon. So Manfred just brings so much to the battlefield. He's bald, he's proud, and uh, he does some serious work. So now, guys, we're going to be jumping on over to the Warriors of Chaos. We'll see you in just a second. And today, my friends, Zinch cackles and KFC rejoices as Sartorial the Everwatcher takes the number one spot for the Warriors of Chaos here in this video. So let's take a look at why. So firstly, he does have access to Lore of Metal, which is not a bad Lore of Magic, especially for Chaos. Uh, being able to use Plague of Rust to make Chaos Knights better, Forsaken better, and even baseline Chaos Warriors win their engagements is very, very solid. Uh, Transmutation of Lead is pretty good for big kind of uh, game deciding fights as well. And also there's a really nice synergy with Final Transmutation and the Bird himself. So Sartorial's high mass. He can generally get where he wants gets where he wants to go. He can't fly, unfortunately, despite having these like glorious wings, you would totally think he would be able to like pick up and fly. That'd actually be, kind of be a cool feature. Although a talk for another time, but if he could like toggle fly and like land, anyways, I think that's something I would like to see someday. But nonetheless, he has high mass and he has really good natural resistances. He has 50% missile resist, and over here you can see his magic resist is 25%. So one of the big issues for big birds, big monsters like this, is they're a really big target for missiles. But if you're going to be shooting Sartorial, he's going to be nullifying 50% of that damage. And if the missiles you're shooting at him are magic, he's also going to be getting an additional 25% on top of that. So he's a pretty tough bird to snipe for sure. He has high mass, he causes terror, his combat stats are okay, but mainly he's like this big wrecking ball that just flies around, disrupts formations with his uh, big old pimp cane there, and uh, also causes terror. But what's cool is you send in Sartorial, your opponents are like, oh, it's a big bird, he's, he's kind of squishy, has 40 melee defense and 30 armor. Let's get in there, let's attack him with everything. So they blob up on top of him. And then with Big Bird, he's ju this juicy final transmutation to punish the blob that forms atop Sartorial. So some really cool synergy with him. And he's a relatively safe pick in most matchups. Uh, for example, if you bring Kolek, he can go down very quick to focus fire in the wrong matchups. If you bring Archeon, he kind of suffers from the same fate. And he's also a little bit overcosted, although he's had some nice buffs that make him really... Uh, much better, but I think that Sartorial, the big bird here, is going to be one of the better picks for the Warriors of Chaos, despite, I believe he had a change to his uh, Missile Resist. I think it was actually a little bit more before, but he's still a very good choice. He has Arcane Conduit, Lore Metal isn't a bad lore, and he's also, he causes terror, he's a big body, he's a big bird with 6,000 HP, and yeah, he just gets around and just disrupts things, which is really nice for Chaos, because oftentimes, 
To bring down this big chicken, you have to invest way more gold than it's worth because of his natural resistances, his mobility, and his mass. So there you have it. There's the Warriors of Chaos. And now, guys, we're going to be going on to the last faction here in the list, which is going to be the Wood Elves. So we'll see you in a second. And now for the last one here in the video, it's going to be the Wood Elves. And for the Wood Elves, it is going to be the female Glade Lord or the Lord of Prey of Anathrema. So there's not too many abilities in the game that I can safely say have just like single-handedly won like 90% of Wood Elf games. But the Glade Lord with the Prey of Anathrema is so good simply because of this one ability. There's not too many other exciting variables. The combat stats are pretty good, uh, decent for the most part. A little bit squishy with only 50 armor and a low HP pool. But basically, it's just Prey of Anathrema. So... Mel Gibson is pretty good, or Orion as he's actually called. Durthu is not bad also, but this Lord is just so good because of the ability to snare and also apply a negative missile resist at the same time. Now, of course, there's other Lords that we've talked about on this list, like Wurzog who has a snare, but the reason why this one is so good and probably, in my opinion, much better than Orion and Durthu is because of the faction that it's in. And for that, it's the Wood Elves because they have Way Watchers, they have Glade Guard, getting a single snare on an enemy Lord or high value unit and just burning them down with the insane DPS of Way Watchers it's just it's so good and therefore the glade lord is going to be the number one pick here for the wood elves as much as it pains me because i think the other lords are just so much more fun and interesting but uh yeah it's going to be the glade lord she also has a couple good mount options she has an eagle she has a a, a mount a, a, a horse i think it's a horse or a unicorn or some sort of a steed like that and she does also have a forest dragon which is quite nice so it can turn her into kind of a dual purpose sniper plus decent melee combatant that can apply poison with its forest dragon and its breath attacks but for the sake of this video, the Glade Lord, the really the focal point, and you can see the mouse has been there the entire time, is Prey of Anathrema. It's so good to play Watchers. It's one of the staples of Wood Elf play, and I'm sure most uh, tournament games with Wood Elves are often decided with the effectiveness of a Prey of Anathrema. Now, in recent times, the male Glade Lord has gotten the Helm of Discord, which really allows you to play a different play style with the Wood Elves, but nonetheless, I still think that this lady here is an OG. She's uh, been winning games for the Wood Elves since the dawn of time, and she does some work. So guys, thank you so much for joining in this video. Hopefully you enjoyed. If there's any other subject matter you'd like me to cover, uh, you know, best, I guess we've already mostly done best units and done worst units and things like that, but I think we actually still have to do a best unit for every faction. That's a really fun video to kind of uh, talk about in theory craft and things like that. But please let me know in the comment section below. I'd really appreciate the feedback in that respect. But for now, thank you guys again for watching. Hopefully you all had an excellent new year. And now we march forward into 2020 with some awesome tournaments, fun content, and all kinds of wild times to come. So thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you on the other side. Take care.